This short clip is presented by Edge. Edge is our pro-to-pro -pro advisory service, which is all about the macro with a focus on one-to-one -one engagement with the hedge fund manager, Craig Shapiro, economics advisor, Jeffrey Fouvry, and direct access to LaDuke Trading founder, Samantha LaDuke. For more information about Edge, visit www.laduketrading.com slash edge. Hey, greetings, and thank you so much for joining us for Macro to Micro Power Hour. I'm Samantha LaDuke, founder of LaDukeTrading.com, joined by Craig Shapiro, our macro advisor, edge manager, here to obviously talk about Fed Day and a little bit of a surprise in that Powell was really kind of couching it, not committing one way or the other. So we're going to dig into that. And then, of course, some economic data of late, specifically employment coming up on Friday, um, unemployment claims Thursday. We had the QRA, which Craig is very focused on, especially as it relates to liquidity bumping <laughs> um, and uh, and such. So let's let's get right into it, Craig. And give me your thoughts on uh, today's Fed announcement and then Powell's presser. Yeah, um, another wild day. Um, you know, sometimes when you watch the the trading during, you know, the 2 p.m. to 3.30 or even to 4 o'clock, you, you, you try to believe that the market is trading on something that he said or didn't say. And and, and often um, it's just about positioning and about, you know, the level of volatility coming into the, the day. And then once we leave the day, there's a lot less volatility in the world. And so in theory, and so there's a lot of fall selling and and look, coming into today, because we had the QRA announcement this morning, we can get into that too. But, um, you know, coming into today, vol was incredibly uh, bid for today, uh, one day vol and, and the VIX. And so it, it was almost like no matter what was said, and plus we had, um, you know, uh, Microsoft earnings last night. Um, so no matter what he said, or, or uh, until two o'clock, you were going to get a vol selling. And so the market was just kind of up on a, you know, up and to the right, really, from I don't know five o'clock last night after Meta after Microsoft numbers were not very good, and you know markets were ripping all night, and China was good, and then you kind of walk in the week of this morning and we're ripping, and no one really knows why, and it's because there's there's false selling, um, and so you know even even when you get to Powell at two o'clock, the statement was very much I think in line with what folks were thinking i think there were there were folks who were thinking that he would actually move um in the third paragraph there's some reference to you know what it might take for them to get more confidence and they kept that that paragraph the same so i think that was a little bit of a disappointment they they did talk about the fact that the labor market continues to to slow and normalize and, and inflation is somewhat now above target where before it was just above target so uh, that was, you know, a, a nod to, OK, we're getting closer. And then there was um, some discussion about, uh, you know, dual sided mandate. But, you know, he could have done more and he didn't. But um, it wasn't a disappointment. Then he gets to speaking and literally every question is the same exact question uh, from every reporter who's just trying to catch him in some you know, way of saying, oh, yes, we're cutting in September. Yet, yet, yes, this is the beginning. Yes, 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 yes. And so. Um, you know, the market's really, you know, reacted positive. You could say the market reacted positively to the press conference, but it's not clear to me that um, the market was really being driven by the press conference more than it was just being driven by Valsa. Um, And it was, I think, I thought it was interesting as the, the day kind of transpired, you know, IWMs, which had been up, you know, considerably, um, you know, kind of started to lag as we kind of got into the last hour and the most short index was up three and a half, four percent, closed up only, you know, close 275 basis points off the high in the last 30 minutes of trading. Um, so I don't think we're out of the woods yet on an understanding here. But my when I step back, you know, look, what I see is is the same. What I see is an economy that continues to slow. The long and lagged impacts of monetary policy are increasingly biting this economy. But what I also see is a Fed that is going to be slow to react to it on purpose. And the market is way ahead of the Fed. So way. it's just it's just it's just a very weird dynamic where the Fed doesn't you know recognizes that once they start cutting, the market's going to keep pricing in, you know, aggressive price, uh, aggressive rate cut, which will loosen financial conditions, which will reignite animal spirits and make it, and push inflation expectations higher and make it harder to get to two. So they're, they're holding out 
um, because they don't, you know, they're they're concerned about starting because they know what the market's going to do. At at the same point, the economy is is dealing with this elevated rate regime, and now is going to go another six weeks before the first cut. And even when we when they cut twenty five, it's going to do nothing. Even Powell himself said. Uh, I think it was last presser, you know, a 25 basis point cuts unlikely to do anything. And when he was asked about 50 basis points, he basically said, that's, un, you know, that's not something we're looking at. And so, mm-hmm. the mar- but the market's already pricing in more than 25 basis points for September. So there, there's a degree of disappointment potentially here where if the data continues to come in, uh, you know, slowing but growing. The Fed's not going to be able to deliver the, those, you know, the aggressive loosening regime that's being priced in. Um, and if the payroll number, you know, somehow comes in hotter than expected, well, then what are they going to do? They're, mm-hmm. they're going to cut into a into a into a, a labor market that doesn't really need it. Um, so uh, to me, it just it, it 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 sounds like a Fed that is pushing towards starting its rate cutting cycle, but it's going to go slow into an economy that, you know, probably could use some easing uh, consumers, you know, more and more consumers are struggling. And, but, it, you know, it, it's an election year. Uh, the Fed doesn't want to be seen too politically uh, seen as being too much on the political side, whether they, you know, cutting or, or rapidly cutting. And so I don't know, to me, it just kind of sounds like air pocket. And I think with the bond market, uh, and, and I know you've been on top of this, just the, in the break, the, the 10 years are breaking, you know, are breaking out, right? Yields are breaking down. Um, the so two the year, bond the five market, year, the 10 year, it's all the breaking, 30 year. It, yeah, yields are all breaking down. And so yes. the bond market is getting more concern about something. Um, so it's, uh, I guess it's a combination of <laughs> what's that. We don't need the fed, the bond market. Yeah, the bond market is, look, the bond market is obviously getting concerned about the, the, the growth dynamic and inflation is coming down. And, and, and that once the employment, uh, unemployment rate starts, uh, to, deteriorate it's gonna be very difficult for it to stop um and probably you know i th- I would imagine the long end is a little bit concerned now maybe about geopolitical risk uh again right we normally would see uh the long end rally when we get oil prices moving up because it's going to destroy demand if we actually you know have another you know five to ten percent move higher in oil because the middle east kind of you know starts to to escalate so the bond market is concerned um, and yields are breaking down towards, uh, you know, levels that I didn't really, at least in the long end, I didn't really anticipate. Um, and yet the equity market is just kind of continues to whistle by, you know, by the graveyard here um, as earnings are not really, you know, they're, they're, they're not really delivering the growth that is needed to justify the multiples. They are delivering potentially versus earnings expectations, which, you know, I, the low, you know, there's been a low bar. And so they're coming in above, you know, expectations, but the, the growth isn't there. And so, I don't know, it just seems like a, a precarious dynamic here as we enter August, September, October in an uncertain electionary, election outcome scenario with, with Harris moving to the top of the ticket. I mean, the odds of a Trump sweep have come down significantly. And oh, let me since show you the that. two can't... Yeah, let me. And since the, since the two candidates are so diametrically opposed on winners and losers in the economy, co- companies are going to sit on their hands. They're they're, they're going to they're going to slow down spending between now and the end of the year. They're going to slow down hiring. They're going to slow down capex. Uh, consumers are going to sit on their hands as well. So I, I think we're moving into you know an uncertainty led growth deceleration that the Fed is going to be late to be able to deal with. These are just um, that Trump Vance bid that everyone was talking about quickly got unwound (laughs) very quickly got unwound i just want to kind of put that up from uh financial times uh earlier today in fact so yes this is a consideration for sure but i I think i I think after that debate right i think after the debate the end of june the the market felt very comfortable people in the in the market start to feel increasingly comfortable that trump was going to win Republicans had a very good chance of sweeping. And so you could consider positioning your portfolio, uh, you know, sometime in the third quarter for the benefits of that Trump uh, regime, whatever, whatever that meant. Um, But that that's off the table now. And I'm not saying that Trump's not going to win or that the Republicans aren't going to sweep. I just think you can it's much more difficult now in August to make that call, given Harris being there, given her the momentum, 
look, she's fundraising like mad, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's a, an aggressive fundraising cycle. People were concerned about the money. The money came in, right, in a big way. So we just don't know. And and so markets are going to- The legit you know, money, be... though, on the small donations, that's a big question. But on the big side, VCs for Kamala is now a website with 110 <laughs> signatures. So, you yeah. know, money is still following. And that's one way to make sure the taxes don't get raised, potentially. All right. So so the implications right now of the, the the Trump sweep are getting hammered and yet they'll come back up if if she does something stupid. So we have a long ways to go. And there's still the wild card, at least of, you know, some of this uh, volatility into election. RFK is a wild card, although losing steam simply because of the money game. Trump and, and Harris have it. What aside from the election kind of volatility that we can see, what do you think is going to be the, the next precursor for volatility? Because we already had the concentration risk um, unwind that triggered that rotation, right? The head fund, head fund factor rotation, short covering. We do not have small caps coming down. That was a bet for today. Many were making that small caps would come down and growth would pop up. In fact, they were very strong, both of them, right? This And the Fed didn't even commit to cutting, which hasn't been priced out of the market. So where do you think this, in th besides positioning from a fundamental standpoint or a growth percent uh, uh, standpoint, where do you think this uh, momentum is uh, targeted for market animal spirits to continue higher? Yeah, look, I mean, we, we've we completely, un you know, completely, we, we, we've unwound this tech versus small cap trade in a very sizable way this month. And, you know, I mean, look, we ended the day, you know, Q's outperform IWMs by 250 basis points, right? So it, it was a big outperformance on the day. Um, I, I think the question from here is what, what you've had is you've had this rotation out of big tech into small caps and and out of quality into crap. Um, it, it, look, you've also had a rotation into gold and into utilities and into, you know, yielding things, which, which I think totally makes sense. But th there has been a part of this rotation that has gone into junk and has gone into small caps. And so... What people have, are making some sort of bet that the economy is is not going to go into recession. Uh, small cap earnings are going to reaccelerate because of the benefits of rate cuts, and I, I don't see it. I just I just really don't think that this cutting cycle, given where we're given what we're what we're pricing right now. Um, so um, look, I think if you if you see, let's say on Friday. Right. You have paper net, net, tomorrow. We get some data. Right. We have the ISM mm -hmm. tomorrow. We got claims tomorrow. Uh, important stuff. And then Friday is payrolls. And next week is ISM services. But if payrolls come in stronger than expected, then it's going to make it harder for the Fed to, you know, uh, accelerate its cutting regime. And if payrolls come in awful, awful. And there had been some some talk about potentially having a, a negative payroll print for coming out. I mean, there was some think tank or some macro strategist that was talking about that. And so who, who knows? But if it's all, if it's awful it, and solidifies that the Fed is behind the curve, well, Powell just told you they're still waiting and that they're mm -hmm. not going to go 50. And so what what's that? Then what? Right. Then we're going to have we have to wait until after the election to get a very big uh, rate cut drop in order to stabilize the economy. To me, both those scenarios seem uh, bad for for junk, for beta, for um, for small caps. Now, Let's uh, talk I, about I don't know QRA exactly. Then. Yeah, well, I was just going to say. I, I mean, look, we still have. Me I mean, Meta is report just reported. I, I don't yeah. know. I don't know what the stock's doing. I, my my machine's so, all messed up here, but it's uh, is it you're, up? You're still traveling. Yes. Um. And look, we have Amazon and Apple tomorrow. Fang, I mean, you know, it's been in, in a decent way. It's kind of been de-risked into these prints. And so, um, you know, if the numbers are okay for Amazon and Apple tomorrow, I can see why Qs, you know, could start to, you know, get a little bit of a bid. Um, but again, we're, we're, we're entering into a precarious time of the year on the calendar, right? And then you can just go back as recently as last year where, you know, basically the, the highs for the year were made on, july 31st uh or it, so which by the way is uh, end and, of month positioning as well some of the reason for the season and, and, and look now last year we had um 
you know, the negatives, it's just, it's just interesting. Like if you look at this, right, look at the chart that you have up there, which talks about the QRA. Yeah. That's why last year, yeah. last year in, um, in on July 31st, we had the QR, well, basically it was August 2nd, but whatever. Um, you, you know, you had the announcement that was going to be higher than expected duration issuance for the fourth quarter, basically for the fourth quarter versus the third quarter. So on this chart, that's the green bar of 339 versus the green and 4Q23 versus the green bar uh, in 3Q23, which is 186, right? That's what got people worried last year in August. Look at where we are now, right? We're at 559 for this quarter and still 475 for next quarter. I mean, we're, we're, we're running, you know, so much higher on duration issuance now than we were a year ago. So, you know, Yellen did not give the pump that people thought was possible into the election. In my view, could she could she have done more? Should they be doing more duration issuance given term premiums are negative and the yield curve is inverted uh, as it is? Absolutely. But it's not like they're not issuing duration. They're issuing more, basically more duration every month from now until forever. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's a lot of bond supply that needs to be digested by this market. Uh, you know, and every auction will get done. But, you know, how excited are folks going to be about buying 10 year at 4%? I, I, I don't know. Um, now, if you believe that we're going into a recession, then why are we buying small caps at record value, you know, at, at very high valuations with limited earnings momentum? So because we don't have in my the view, so, in my view, something, something has to give. Yeah. So look, I think, I, I think there, there's a camp of people who believe like I do that the economy is is slowing and will continue to slow and probably needs to uh, start getting some accommodation. There is another camp out there that believes the economy has already bottomed and is going to reaccelerate um, based on how loose financial conditions are. And so, uh, you know, if, if that's your view, I can understand why you might think that next year's earnings momentum for small caps is going to be that much better. I just, I'm struggling to see that. And after the destruction of wealth that we've seen in the last three weeks as tech has come off, like I think it makes it's harder to see trillion. it's hard <laughs> it's harder to see that, right? It's harder to see that uh happening now into the end of the year. Add on the political uncertainty, um, which I think is a very big deal and not something that folks are are keen in on, right? I mean, consumers are gonna retrench, corporates are gonna retrench. This is the most divisive um political you know, agenda, I think that, you know, dichotomy that we've seen, you have one, one guy uh, who's looking at tax cuts, massive tariffs, uh, it, you know, an inflationary policy that way. And then you have an, the other regime, which is about spending hikes, you know, tax increases. Um, so if you're a company and you don't really know if you're going to, you know, and, and, and one is pro energy, one's not as pro energy, right? If you, if you are a company who doesn't know, who the what the administration is going to look like? It's going to be hard for you to plan that you're you know to expand capex for 2025 at this point. You're just you're just going to sit on you're just going to sit and wait. And I think that's going to start showing up in you know in the soft data and these PMIs in in coming weeks and months. And I, I think the, the economy will prove that it needs more that it does actually need more accommodation. Uh, and the Fed is going to be still be slow to deliver it. All right, let's talk about Bank of Japan since that came in yesterday and last night, excuse me. Um, they decided to hike by 25 basis points. But the funny thing is this new, I mean, this new policy, right? Wolf Richter actually um, highlights the real policy rate is still massively negative, right? With this, with this new positive 0.25%. Um, it's far below core at 2.6%. Uh, this timing, by the way, of the dollar yen uh, breaking from 162 down into 152 through 152 uh, was a real kind of timed event with the NASDAQ concentration risk de-risking the past few weeks. Yeah. And then they came out with their hike, but um, offered kind of not to do so much of the um, the bond selling Similar to QRA this morning, right? Didn't you uh, kind of point out that Yellen, everything was as expected, but yeah. there's going to be kind of an infusion of like 15 billion 
because she's doubling on the the, the, the bond. Yes. So explain that both of those a little well, bit. Well, look, better. I mean, uh, for, 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 <laughs> for yeah, for Yellen and for Treasury, Treasury is doing, you know, they're 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 doing buybacks, right? Um, yes. And they doubled. Last, thank you. And last quarter, they said that that the first quarter was going to be a you know basically trial, and that they expected to get to thirty billion by August. And so, lo and behold, they're now they're going to be at thirty billion by August. So yeah. it wasn't a it wasn't a surprise, but it is on the margin liquidity. Now the question really is, what Treasury is supposed to be doing is buying back off the run duration securities and replacing them with on the run same maturity securities. And so th there's you know a modest pickup to liquidity because you know some holders of off the run those are less liquid and you you know not as good in the way as as collateral and so uh they hit leverage a little bit so but if they're duration neutral it's not really that much liquidity some people believe that they're gonna you know buy those bonds with bit with bills that they've issued in which case that would be more liquidity additive but that's really not what they're doing so i i don't really think this treasury buyback program is uh, a substantial liquidity adder um, okay. some people just, you know, have whatever narratives they, they want, but the map doesn't really check out there. Um, the, 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 the yen, uh, and BOJ clearly there, there was strong correlation across the world, you know, cross asset correlations between the dollar yen move and the tech move and borrowing in yen to fund carry trades, uh, in us equities and, and other risk on assets. And so, Look, when when we you know got to the point when dollar yen made it above 160, you know more job owning, more you know um, talk that there were going to be things like what happened today, rate hikes, slow the bond buying, whatever. When you marry that with you know some of the um, you know after July expiry and some of the call buying, you know, and the gamma stuff that kind of went away, you kind of had the tech unwind, and you had the be a, the, the dollar yen unwind, which led to more tech unwind, which led to more mm -hmm. dollar yen unwind, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that was was, was correlated. Um, but now you're in a situation where I mean, dollar yen is five month lows. Um, people who borrow in yen to speculate uh, and do it on hedge now have been losing on the currency uh, as the yen is rallied, and now it's more expensive to do it, right? Because mm -hmm. the, you know the mm -hmm. yen is uh, is now more expensive because they've raised rates, so. Um, it was interesting today that we had such a big move in dollar yen, uh, yen stronger and risk assets and it was risk on, but I think it kind of shows you that, you know, the larger flow is fall selling in S and P and that's <laughs> into the fed meeting. But I don't think that we're out of the woods yet. I think if, if dollar yen continues to, to weak, if the dollar continues to weaken against the yen, I think we're going to be pushed into a more of a deleveraging scenario and, and more of a risk off type of regime. I mean, yes, it's the case that. Japan hasn't really done a lot, uh, but on the margin, they've tightened and, you know, they can either have, um, if they have higher yields, uh, it'll lead to higher dollar, yet higher, a stronger yen, which impacts their economy negatively, impacts their exporters, hurts them that way. So how, how you know, how are they going to get out of this trilemma that they're in? Um, you know, probably going to have some growth disappointments that come from a stronger yen and higher yields. And so how long can they really exist if that's the regime that, that they're looking for? But you know, clearly when you have these two, two and a half percent moves in dollar yen um, in a day, th things are not like casual in, in, in global risk, right? There, there's more, there, there's things going on to the surface. There's folks who are in pain. There's books that are going to be forced to be deleveraging and that's going to, you know, impact, uh, you know, other assets. So the interesting thing in after hours, by the way, isn't to me anyway, isn't that Meta is up, you know, tagging 497 area, um, which is elevated, right? There's about 504 is strong resistance. It's having a hard time getting in, above that. It's that the 10 year yield has dumped further and yep. the yield just across the board that uh, two year that I keep showing, if we break 4.2, it's really going to come down with or without and that's the strange part about this, right? Where um, are we at this cycle where, and I want to show that chart again, I think I um, might need a minute to find it, but that the two year breaks that 4.2 and Fed is just still sitting on the sidelines. What what does that say about where we're headed with yields clearly giving a path lower, five, seven, 10, 30? Um, it's been great for my warm summer house, you know, housing market call where the 30 year would fall, move, 
would fall, the 10 year would fall, and then lots of potential um, you know, mortgage refinancing, nothing like 2020 or 2008, 2009, but just the fact that it would create more of that, um, uh, you know, cash request, a uh, demand in, in refinancing uh, that may or may not be used for more equity um, buys. But the big picture is this is still falling quite strongly, regardless of what Yellen is doing, regardless of what Powell is saying. Thoughts on this whole complex rolling over hard now where yeah. where are we at look i think you you know there there's a there's a trade off right basically for equities and if you know it's multiples for, and earning expectations and and you know kind of drive where equity prices go and multiples are often driven you know by the moving yields right and so there's a dynamic in play where as yields fall multiples expand um, you know, there's, uh, you know, bonds versus stocks reason, you know, there's, um, you know, Fed model reason. And so you can get that kind of multiple expansion when yields fall. The question is, um, are yields, why are yields falling, fall, falling? And are they indicative of some economic reality that is going to be worse for the earnings growth outlook? In which case that multiple expansion it, you know, you 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 got what you got out of multiple expansion. Now earnings are going to start to get hit because the economy is slowing, and so, you know, there's no more reason to buy uh, equities now. Something like housing, right? ITB, you know, has made a high, or, or very close to the high. I forget, you know, because of this move in rates. Mm -hmm. But mortgage activity is still garbage, right? There has been no refinancing wave yet. No, they're already pricing in the potential. No, that, right, right. So, so this market has front run the front yes. run, and yes. and and I think what that that's been you know in part because of rotations and unwinds and out of tech into somewhere else, right? So, you know the the mark, but the market is stretching these relationships well beyond what the economic realities are, and so the question is, you know, really. What are the economic realities? Are we going into a more protracted slowdown between here and the end of the year and into next year? Or, as some people think, um, you know, th this these move this move lower lower in rates has put a floor in economic growth. And if we have um, you know, two, two and a half percent inflation and two and a half percent growth you know we're at five percent nominal and that's you know the economy is going to be fine and i think that there's a i think that the, the the jury is out on that i i know which way that i'm betting i'm betting that the bond market is getting concerned because growth is rolling over but it's not um it's not clear yet and so yeah i think itb and housing is has, has benefited from that multiple expansion uh from rates moving down but it has done very you know the the, the move in the real economy has really not uh, reacted to, um, you know, the fall in in yields. And I, I saw something from Ivy Zellman, who's the housing analyst, and, and a couple other folks who basically say, look, they don't really expect mortgage rates to move, uh, you know, really much lower in the next three to six months. I mean, if you kind of think about term premiums and historical mortgage spreads, um, a four percent ten year is unlikely to generate a mortgage rate well below 6%. And so, okay, you know, we're at six, we're, we're between six and a half and seven right now. Like is the move to 6% really going to stimulate a lot of housing demand? Is it really going to stimulate a massive refi wave? Probably not. So to me, that, that, that stuff, that's really bad. The, the cyclical things that have benefited from lower rates seem stretched. Something like utilities uh, or, def you know, real you know, staples or real defensives that are benefit from a slowing economy um, from a rotation perspective. I think maybe those are safer places to bet on on the yield move yields moving down. But clearly, the bond market is worried about growth uh, in and, you know, uh, the Fed seems way less worried about growth than the bond market does. So let's take a look at that bond market and that yield spread also right now. So I was just mentioning um, after hours, Meta is um, having a nice little ramp. So is the ten-year side by side with the ten, with the two-year um, T-note futures. So this is pretty 
pretty bold up too. Um, then we're kind of, we've gone over this chart before, but this is the 10 two year yield curve. And that spread is on a weekly side by side with a daily. And when the market was all excited that Fed was going to cut, Fed was going to cut, September has 100% chance, right, in, uh, in Fed cutting uh, 25 basis points, and it was growing to 20, 30% chance of a 50 basis point cut. That all came unwound. <laughs> Not all, but of late, it has started to come unwound. And now the odds have dropped to only an 80% chance of a 25 basis cut for September and likely falls further unless Powell comes out Jackson Hole time frame and starts to get a little bit more dovish. Um, any comments also on this very contorted uh, yield curve? Yeah, we, we, we've we've talked about this, you know, this this pattern for quite some time um, and which way would it break? And clearly it seems like it's broken to the upside. Steepners have, have been the, the winner. And so the question is why, why have steepeners won? Why is the curve really steepened? And I think it's because we've gone, in my view, it's because we've gone so long at, at such elevated rates that we've done a lot of damage to the economy such that, you know, the market's not thinking, okay, the Fed's problem. Once the Fed gets going on cutting, they're going to, they're going to really get going. They're going to really cut uh, aggressively because one cut's not going to do anything. The labor market's deteriorating. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that would behoove a lower, lower rates in the front. And then in the back, look, I mean, it, whether it's Biden or Trump, I mean, we basically have long-term inflationary policies. We just don't know how we're going to, you know, get them yet, but the deficits are not really going to, are not really going to fall. They're going to continue to grow. And, you know, there's going to be some, eventually there'll be a, a sell-off in the long end because folks think, believe that, you know, 4% is not appropriate level of, of a comp, you know, of, of financial compensation for the level of deficits. Um, you know, look, I mean, the truth of the matter is like, yes, it's true that bond yields have, uh, you know, fallen tremendously too, but gold's also at, at the highs. And it's not, so it's not mm -hmm. as if, it's not as if we're getting, you know, I, I, bonds are really outperforming gold. Um, I think we're just in a, in a regime there, you know, here where um, there is a slowdown. It's being increasingly priced in. There's an expectation of stimulus to come from the Fed at some point. The market wants more and sooner. Um, the Fed's been reluctant to do that, but it will happen eventually. Um, and so, look, I mean, I just, again, I just don't think you're being adequately compensated at this point for taking that level of duration risk in, in long-term treasuries at negative term premiums when you could still keep your money in cash uh, earning 5.3% now still yet for another quarter um, or at least another six weeks. And even through the end of the year, you know, it's unlikely that we're going to get more than, than, than two cuts. And so you know, there's really no reinvestment risk um, versus 4% for 10 years, given all the, all the deficit growth and all the, the fixed supply growth uh, duration supply growth. I'd much rather own gold um, that'll benefit from the printing and the eventual dollar weakness than I would want to own, on treasuries out the curve. So um, by the way, this is the silver gold ratio on a monthly that's just very, very bullish. So the trend is, is that silver. that that's bullish gold over silver, right? It's that very going bullish. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's, Which I think makes very... sense, right? Because that, that's telling you that that the gold silver ratio going up, gold outperforming is indicative of an economy that's slowing because silver is more of an industrial metal um and, and benefits when global growth is reaccelerating. Whereas gold benefits in, you know, a, a slowing growth environment, more of a deflationary environment, or even eventually, you know, a massive money printing environment. So I think this is, I think, I think the gold silver ratio looking like this with bonds rallying like they are with utilities mm -hmm. making highs um, is, is suggestive of a, a, a concern about global growth, a concern um, or lack, you know, no real need to be concerned about inflation reaccelerating yet at this point, um, and likely headwinds for uh, corporate profits and a more of a risk off scenario. That I think that's I think it's consistent. The only thing that's not consistent so Look far at push up today even. Yeah, the thing that's not with consistent. Bonds. I mean, this is continuous contract yeah. on daily. It took it out of the ratio yep. with this dollar yen. Yep. I mean, um, benefited it benefited at the end of the day, I think, as well from the Iran headlines that's time. Yes. But yeah. but but still, I mean, it's it's been 
kind of buying time and building value here at high levels and looks explosive again. I, and I, again, I think it's because folks are concerned about the economy rolling over. And so the only thing that's not consistent is cyclical junk equities, including small caps and most short names kind of being at the highs. And that to me is more indicative of unwind and, and positioning and deleveraging as opposed to, um, you know, some economic reality that the economy is about to reaccelerate. Let me show my, um, and then let me open up to questions afterward as well. So get definitely, definitely feel free to hit us up with questions. This is that growth value rotation. I know you have your own version of sector rotation when it becomes extremely overbought, extremely oversold. Anyway, long story short, I look at this every single day, right? I'm looking for that opportunity to say, hey, this is extremely overbought, um, which then when it starts to roll over, it's a really good place to position short NASDAQ 100. Long story short. So this was the warning, right, on the July 9th, 10th timeframe. And this has really crashed lower. Again, 2.6 trillion was taken out of the MAG7 uh, stocks over the past two, three weeks, whatever it was. Um, but the point is, we've had a little bit of a bounce today. That's it. It yeah. seems more dramatic. Like you just said, positioning, that big yeah. suppression with FOMC, the end of month positioning, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. We have had an opportunity for a massive oversold bounce in growth, but this really didn't take off so much because small caps did outperform at one point after Fed was done, uh, after Powell was done, then they started to um, retrace a little bit. But at one point they were up 2.2%. Yep. And Nasdaq was up three percent. That's not such a wide spread. And yeah, then- I think that's I think that I think that peak was when I uh, tweeted in, in in my channel. This is annoying as fuck. Uh, so, <laughs> I think that was right about uh, right about three o'clock or three o five. All right, right about you the timed high, that so. well. <laughs> so, um, but, but relatively speaking, this still has a lot of room for I think this is, Yeah, ah. I think this is going to. I think this is going to bounce this, here. I think this, this ratio is going to finished. This I hasn't think this even re- finished yet. I, I think if if, if you if we wanted to play prognosticator here, I, I think this ratio is about to bounce. Um, it, you know, over the course of the next few days, into you know maybe into next week, maybe even aggressively. Um, you know, and kind of get the mat that MACD maybe back up to zero, whatever, and the, the ratio is somewhere, you know, into the underside of that head and shoulders breakdown, whatever, whatever. I don't know. But, no, my point but, is, but well, I'm looking at bonds. They are freaking out right now. Now, I know there's that Iran headline. Can you uh, read off a little bit the, the, the content of that? So, because in fact, in folk, for folks- There was a time, there, yeah, there was, there was a Times, there was a Times piece that came out for, that said Iran is going to attack Israel, um, you know, like imminently. Um, okay. And so, so that's why bonds, gold um, are, and then by the way, uh, volatility did, did not die an ugly death. That I've been watching that like a hawk. I still think that can tag 20. I still think this needs to base. I still think that the Qs have a lower, I know we're in the thick of it with Meta. I know we're in the thick of it with Apple um, and Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. But I still have this a uh, solid area where I think 449 gets tagged in the queues before we can really get this ratio to base properly. And uh, SPX tags that 4376. We haven't hit it. We we, we got a 50, solid 53, 5376. 5376. Oh 4376 would be. No, no, something, no, something. no, no, no. That's, Eventually, that's, maybe next year. Maybe next year that we'll get there. Or no, maybe <laughs> even September, October. But no, that's oh, not man. exactly good yeah. catch. But the point is, we had a very solid, you know, bounce at the 100 day for Nvidia, for the Qs, etc. But now maybe this headline softens a little bit, or Meta, you know, doesn't um, hold its gains uh, post market. Okay, so let's. We've talked about, and you just came back from the Bitcoin conference, so it, you, we got to highlight your um, your in, your insights, your review there. But uh, also wanted to remind, if anyone wants to ask a question, just hit us up, and. Um, that growth rotation, as long story short, is not done basing. So we still can have an enormous amount of chop into the end of the week, depending on how, of course, market reaction is to Meta, Apple, Amazon, non-farm payrolls, ISM manufacturing Thursday, unemployment claims Thursday. We still have a lot of economic data. We still have a lot of gyrations um, in, in, in chop. So I don't think it's a a fait accompli that we're going to bounce. But when we do finish basing and move higher, I think it will be a very strong one. Uh, give us your your thoughts on the Bitcoin conference because you have been traveling the countryside 
And uh, one of your stops was Nashville. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the biggest takeaway for me from the Bitcoin conference, and, and I, I wrote about this in the channel and I tweeted about it, is it, it seems like the political environment around Bitcoin specifically, forget, I don't I don't look at the other cryptos. I think they're all garbage. Um, I, I think Bitcoin has store of value characteristics that make it an interesting uh, macro asset. To me, both sides uh, are, are moving in a direction that is more Bitcoin friendly uh, than it's been in the last, you know, then forever, really. Um, and it's not clear that either side actually understand uh, political side actually mm -hmm. understands what they're doing um, and what Bitcoin is meant to do. It's meant to separate money from the state um, and money printing from the state. And so um, you can imagine that if government agents actually understood that they um, may not like it so much, but so, but, but it's clear that um, there, there is a, a degree of wealth and increasing uh, political influence associated with the Bitcoin class of citizens in this country. And so both sides kind of realize that they have to be, uh, this is, you know, politics in America is about who has the money. Um, and so Bitcoin holders are becoming a much in more interesting uh, political constituency with you know, tens of millions of, of voters in this country own Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the the era of Elizabeth Warren and Gary Gensler kind of, you know, holding down the fort and trying to be disruptive to Bitcoin's uh, growth seems to be going down by the wayside. Now, RFK is obviously at the floor, you know, the front is a front runner here. He's a Bitcoin disciple, really, for a lot of reasons. And he gave a very powerful speech at the conference, which I encourage people to to actually to listen to. This is very interesting how he talks about as Bitcoin is freedom. But Trump kind of, you know, obviously, because Trump, you know, has a nose for where the money is, um, is, you know, kind of uh, rode the coattails there and basically, you know, said, I'm not going to screw with Bitcoin. Bitcoin mining is going to be in America. I like Bitcoin again, even though I said it was a scam several years ago. And, you know, I don't, I don't think it was any anything genuine about what he had to say per se, but I think he's being, you know, advised now increasingly by, you know, Bitcoin billionaires and tech evangelists who say, look, this is like America needs Bitcoin before other countries kind of figure out its dynamics. And if China, Russia and others start to harden their currency ahead of us, it could be a real problem for us in the future. And so, I think he's being advised in that direction. And so he's become more supportive of it. And as far as the Democrats are concerned, look, there, there were there were Democratic uh, congressional speakers at the conference. And there was a, a letter that was written to the Harris administration. She was invited to speak logistically. I think it was impossible for her to get there. But there was a, a letter from from several congressmen basically uh, asking her and the and you know, the campaign to, you know, kind of tone down the tone down the, the aggressiveness of the Biden administration towards Bitcoin. Um, and I think that that's, and I think that's, that's a, that's momentum. That's good. If you're a kind of long-term Bitcoin, uh, person like I am. And so now, as far as the price action, you know, since the, I, I think people were, uh, you know, long calls into the event. And so now we're getting some unwind of that. Um, and it has, you know, today it's, I mean, it's getting sold down further now, uh, after hours. And so look, I, I, I know, I have this up. yeah, Sorry look, Bit that. Bitcoin <laughs> does, Bitcoin does, you know, ha serve, different purposes at different times for different people. And, and, but it is a liquid, it, it is an, it is a, as Luke Roman puts it, it's the last uh, function, you know, functioning smoke alarm. It's not a controlled market. The feds own it, you know, it's, it's just pure supply and demand. Um, and so when there's liquidity issues, it, it, it shows it. Um, and so if liquidity is, is coming out of the system, which, you know, I, I think it is, you can understand why Bitcoin could get hurt on a day like today. Um, also the last day of the month. And so there could have been some contract change, whatever, who knows. But um, I, I think Bitcoin sets up well for a run into year end and into next year. Short term, though, if I'm right, we're going to have more of a risk off scenario. Um, I probably rather own gold here over big but i i know jeffrey and you know still believes it's it, it it's fraudulent money um and well, i know he's he not the only one I don't know, but, but, he, and he, others, he, but but look i think it's people who um if you don't believe in bitcoin then you you have to believe in gold um and so from my view you have to own them both you need a store of value asset in your portfolio that is uncorruptible that where, where supply growth cannot be messed with um that's what bitcoin is and if you are 
a, a citizen of a country that has hyperinflation or risk of expropriating your money or is being bombed by, you know, Iran or Israel or somewhere else and you need to flee, um, you can leave with all of your wealth in your head. That's a very powerful tool um, that will increasingly become important in, in the society that is, is being uh, created and accelerated um, here. So, but if you don't believe in Bitcoin, you, you need a store value asset. The gold is significantly underpriced, um, and so but make sure you make sure you make sure you make sure you own gold. And live well, that's the media. thing. You, the the thing option. is, the thing is, we don't have a a method of holding politicians responsible anymore um, because the Fed. Well, and in America, the Fed doesn't allow the bond market to enact discipline because every minute that the U.S. Treasury market becomes dysfunctional and tries to input. Um, discipline on congr- on on the administration or on Congress and in D.C., the Fed comes in, prints money, and th- there's no there's no reason for discipline. So we used to have discipline uh, when we had a gold standard because gold acted as discipline on profligate government spendings around the world. When your government overspent, gold would be drained from your or your country's coffers, and your currency would devalue enough to a point to create inflation in the domestic economy and kind of force spending by governments to be uh, retrenched. But we don't have a gold standard anymore and we don't have anybody who's doing that. So Bitcoin, a Bitcoin standard or even a return to a gold standard would, would employ some of that discipline over government spending. We just don't have that in America. We don't have that in really any country in the world. Maybe the only country that we really kind of have it in is potentially China. Because China doesn't do fiscal stimulus to the degree that mm-hmm. we do it in the West. And not surprisingly, maybe surprising to some, China's bond market has been ripping for months. China yields are basically the lows. And so there, there is a flow of money that feels comfortable with, with the Chinese government, um, Chinese government bond market because of a belief that China is not going to go down this spending path like the West does because uh, unfortunately China gives – you know, less of a shit about more of its citizens than 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 we do. It's a dictatorship. So, uh, but but we need that kind of discipline. But we don't have it. Bitcoin could give that. Uh, gold could give that. You need to have those types of assets as part of your as part of your portfolio. Um, question on which you think are going to be driving factors on uh, employment. I want to just kind of grab a quick chart that I retweeted earlier, which is here. Um, You can kind of see that um, wages keep cooling. And this has actually been a big, big, big theme of mine leading up where wage inflation delayed recession. It was outpacing. uh, First, inflation was outpacing wages and then wages caught up. And then wage inflation actually outpaced inflation. Now, with the rate of change, inflation is, um, you know, we hit our negative print last month uh, for the first time, rate of change. And then uh, you, you've got now today, you know, private sector wages grew at a 3.5% annualized rate. Sorry about that. I want to show this. There we go. Um, annualized rate in Q2, the slowest pace since fall of 2020. So now recession risk potential um, getting pulled forward. And of course, we still haven't seen unemployment uh, tick higher. Construction jobs are still, um, you know, strong, but any particular economic data that you're looking at coming up that's going to give you uh, more clues or concerns to growth slowdown that you're in particular looking at? Yeah, look, I mean, we we get, um, you know, this week and next week, we, we, we get the July data, right? We, we're going to get the hard, we get some soft data to start the month, and then we get the hard data addresses. And look, I mean, July data should be, should have benefited from the loose financial conditions that we saw in May and June, where markets were good, uh, risk assets were high, and but you know the last couple of weeks of July when tech started getting hit, uh, that could that could hit sentiment too. Um, so we had ADP this morning on on job growth mm-hmm. and you know 122 versus 155 last month. Um, Friday's payrolls are looking for a similar degree of deceleration from markets looking for 175. Versus 206 last month. I've seen, like I said earlier, you know, some people think it could be really bad. Um, I, I, you know, 
it's not clear that it's it's really bad. I don't. I, I still think there is there is jobs growth. I mean, the the, the jolts data showed, yes, a, a decline in quits, meaning people want to hold on to their jobs more. They're they're getting worried about you know trying to leave their jobs, but mm -hmm. there's still plenty of job openings out there. So, I don't know. I, I think this job. I think the labor market is slowing, but I don't think it is falling out of bed. Because if it was falling out of bed, you'd see it in the claims data, and we we just we just haven't really. Seen, I have that. I know. You know I have that a, level two hundred and sixty-seven thousand, yeah, and then yeah. we will trigger some we're, volatility. But until then, we are just, we're just yeah, we're we're not in the wall of worry. So I, I think the labor market is slowing, but I don't think it is. I don't think it is uh, catastrophic. And you know, tomorrow we get ISM manufacturing markets looking for you know recessionary data again, and I suspect that's what we're going to get. Prices paid still above fifty is expected. I suspect that's what we're going to get. Um, and new order is below 50. Um, so, you know, no, but manufacturing is not going to be the place that where there's employment gain, where that, that's not going to drive us out of the economy. Um, but Monday, we have the, the services ISM number, um, which was a disaster last month, um, came in at 48.8. Market's looking for, you know, resumption of strong services ISM back to 51.5 as of right now this month. So, um, look, I think if we get that good data for the month of July, over the course of the next few uh, days, it's going to make it harder for the Fed to to set up September. Uh, so it's certainly not, you know, to the degree of easing that is already being priced in, mm -hmm. uh, which is more than the dot plot is more than 50 basis points uh, for this year and greater than uh, 25 for September. So um, that could be, that could be a uh, disappointment. And then the inflation print comes on, I'm just trying to pull up the calendar here. It comes up, not obviously it's not next week. It's the following week. Um, what day is that? CPI is on the 14th, which is Thursday. Two basically two weeks. That's basically two weeks from today, I guess. Um, or two, and mm -hmm. that's the same week as expiry week. So, and then you retail mm. sales right there too. Oh, so, fun times. Yeah, and want, then next want... and next week we'll also have a lot of bond supply. Um, auctions are back next week, tens and thirties and fives. So, um, or threes, tens and thirties next week. So I want to bring up this chart real quick of when we were talking about employment, um, Warren Pies did a good, uh, review of year over year job gains and only this is falling. And so we're, we haven't quite triggered that, uh, 60% level, but when we do, this is also traditionally hit stocks yeah. hard. So this is another level to kind of keep an eye out for as it relates. Yeah, I, to look, I, I think the areas of the economy that are showing job growth are areas that are not particularly uh, GDP maximizing, right? The government is one uh, and healthcare, right? And like, so the more we put Speaking people into work- Right here. Government exactly. jobs and healthcare jobs and education jobs, right? This is basically the, yeah, I mean, so this makes sense, right? Like, so yeah. the air, the more cyclical parts of the economy are showing clear- signs of deceleration mm -hmm. but uh, there is a large chunk of this economy that is involved in growth in government in healthcare and in pay and in uh education so um you know it's uh it's a it's a weird it's a weird economy it's 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 a <laughs> in, in a lot of ways the thing the more cyclical areas are slowing the more defensive areas are kind of holding on from a long term oh, perspective love it. Actually, From a long-term perspective, like a government, like an economy, that, yeah, a government that's being driven by its government and its healthcare sector, it, it that, that's just not a good. This is not a sustainably strong uh, economy that like makes things and is going to have sustainable growth into the future. So we have some structural issues that need to be addressed in this economy, but those are not going to be addressed until we have a new government, um, and that government, you know decides more macro type policies to encourage manufacturing encourage chip production encourage infrastructure whatever the whatever it is like we, we're going to need more macro planning um it, it if there's any hope otherwise this, this economy is just going to keep moving in a in that in this k-shaped way of wealth inequality being exacerbated and eventually it'll be a very big problem for america but hopefully whatever administration comes in next we'll be able to to write, you know, to write some of those, those trends. Right. Well, we definitely, I I hope anyway, um, covered lots of your travels, right? Because you are literally summer traveling. 
um, with the the family yeah. and animals. So the, it's the, good. The, the good thing about the good thing about being on the road. Up. One of the good things about being on the road is you you do get to kind of see, you know, it's it's kind of like the Peter Lynch style of investing. You know, you just kind of go out and see like what people are doing and where are they spending? Is labor tight? How does it feel to, you know, go out to restaurants in certain geographies versus others? Um, I, look, I for me, what I what I what I'm thinking is is going on is I think people planned summer vacations feel like. They needed rest. They needed to get out. They needed to travel. Um, I think what we're going to have is a when we return to school is going to be a return to reality, mm -hmm. um, and it, it it's going to be a problem for growth because and that starts really that starts next week. The South goes back to school next, you know, early parts of the South next week. My kids go back in two weeks. Um, so basically, summer's over for an increasing part of the country, like every day that, that goes by. People think it's after Labor Day. Well, half the country goes back to school middle of August. So um, I think we're going to start to see that in the data. I think people are going to hunker down. They're going to get their house in order. They're, they're going to stop spending. Um, you know, and some of, some of the good data about airline travel and about restaurants. I think there's a, like a lot of this was like planned well in advance and I, I feel like as the summer has moved on, like, you know, things are a little bit less crowded. Uh, things are not as, um, you know, I'm not really having issues, you know, getting my my camper into, you know, national parks. And 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 oh. um, so and these are like, you know, these are marginal anecdotal things. But, you know, when you when you are observing or keeping an eye on it, but I that, that's I, what I'm not really seeing is like reacceleration. I just don't see this reacceleration dynamic. Um, I think the loose financial conditions that I've talked about and others, have, I think it's really just gone for, you know, basically has just gone to rich people. And there's, there, there's just more people who are struggling paying bills. You know, you've seen that in, the, in some of the delinquency data um, articles about even middle-class folks or, or folks, you know, earning more than a hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, having mm -hmm. a, a bit more struggle paying bills and paying their credit card bills. I think that dynamic is, 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 is out there. And that's one of and, the reasons why I look at the refi rate because 90% of mortgages, right. Are under 5%. If we do have a, a refi wave, it's not because they want to refinance at a higher rate. It's because they need the money. Right. So, so I don't think we're going to get that refi like, into equity into risk i think people who are refining are basically saying shit i have a good mortgage my house is worth 40 50 percent more than what exactly. i paid for it yeah i, I kind of need to tap that i'm willing yes. to that's why i watch uh, it that's why i am like really on this since march yeah like, this is what i see coming but i also see you know these earnings we could we have you know two more quarters before we really hit a wall next year so it's just one of those things that I'm watching. It's early, but it has worked. That 30-year, the 10-year, the move index, they're all falling. And with that, mortgage rates are going to trigger some refinance. Not a huge wave, but it's yeah. very telling who will refinance. Are they doing it to get a lower rate? <laughs> yeah, no, it's people are, you know, they're trying to capture, trying to trying to pull some of that value out of their out of their home because yeah. they need the money to pay bills. Um, yeah. I think you're going to see. All right. So, well, enjoy the rest of your travels. I love doing this every week. I get to see new curtains in the background wherever you wait. These are my RV. These are my RV. I'm in my RV today. You're in my RV. You're in your, okay. So, yeah. Well, I can tell by the backdrop, you've got new curtains every week. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, safe travels home. And right. uh, we'll catch up in two weeks uh, just because. And we'll, we'll probably do it on CPI day. Uh, 14? I think that's that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. Let's do it. yeah. That that's yeah. That, that that's a perfect day. All right, August, super. August 14th. Yep. Excellent. All right. Okay. Cheers. All Bye. Right, Bye, Bye. Bye. Subscribe to Leduc Trading YouTube channel for more macro to micro power hour videos and other content.